Scientists are drawing an ever clearer connection between climate change and extreme weather, which threatens global human health and safety. We depend on climate for our very existence, from the food we grow, to the air we breathe, to the storms we weather. Changes to the balance of our climate propose an existential threat to our way of life, and even possibly a literal threat lending to mass migration and suffering. The sooner we address this climate change, the sooner we'll have less suffering. Welcome to everyone tuning in to join the Samuel Lawrence Foundation's first Friday series webinar titled The Climate Conversation, Media's Impact on Civic Action. My name is Bart Ziegler, the president of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. We collaborate through science, art, and education to find solutions to our planet's greatest challenges, from nuclear safety to climate change. And climate change is exactly what we're here to talk about today. I'll turn this over to our moderator from Brooklyn Story Lab, Lance Gould, to introduce this talk and our wonderful panel of speakers. Lance. Thank you so much, Bart. Uh, today, we are pleased to welcome three esteemed meteorologists and scientists for a discussion about our changing climate and what the role of climate reporters and meteorologists should be in conveying information about climate change to the public. Chris Gloninger has had a long and successful career as a meteorologist reporting on weather and climate change. He now works as a climate and risk communication senior scientist at Woods Hole Group. Chris, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much uh, for having joining me. Chris is, absolutely. And joining Chris is Lauren Casey, a meteorologist for the Climate Matters Program at Climate Central, who specializes in communicating the connections between climate change and extreme weather events. She has worked across the country from Georgia to Philadelphia and beyond as a trusted broadcast meteorologist. Lauren, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Excellent. And we're also delighted to have John Morales with us. John was literally in the heart of the storm this week as the longest tenured broadcast meteorologist in South Florida, John reports on storms like Hurricane Adalia, guiding the region through extreme weather events. John, welcome. Uh, it's an honor to be here, thanks. Excellent, and thank you all for joining us in this live stream. Before we jump into this discussion, here are a couple of uh, brief housekeeping items. The chat will be open for the duration of the briefing, so click on the chat icon on your Zoom toolbar to open your chat box. For questions, We'll be using the Q&A box, so click on the Q&A icon on your Zoom menu to submit your questions. You can submit questions at any time, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can toward the end of the session. We are recording this webinar, and we will share the video and transcript on the Samuel Lawrence Foundation website in the following days. Now, let's talk about the climate conversation, media's impact on civic action. As Bart noted so beautifully in the opening of the program, Scientists are drawing ever clearer connections between climate change and extreme weather threatening human health and safety. Humanity is dependent on a livable climate for our existence, for food, for shelter, breathable air. Changes to the balance of our climate propose an existential threat to our way of life. But in this politicized environment, that, ex that existential threat can extend to even talking about climate change. One need go no further than ask our first panelist, Chris Gloninger, who received death threats from his reports on climate when he was a meteorologist for an Iowa TV station. Chris, thanks so much for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got started as a meteorologist and how you landed in Iowa and how you ended up where you are today? And so my journey started actually back in second grade. Like uh, many meteorologists, there's been that crystal clear moment where our future almost comes into focus. And typically it's become because of a weather event. And for me, it was Hurricane Bob back in the early 90s, which hit my hometown. And I had this fascination with the weather, which lasted through middle school, high school. And then I went to school for meteorology. Uh, in college, got my undergraduate degree in atmospheric and climate science, and then began my journey into uh, broadcast meteorology. Uh, when I started covering climate change, I had covered numerous major weather events. After Hurricane Bob, we entered into this lull of activity, 
And, and then I, while I was in Albany, New York, I covered Hurricane Irene. And then the next year, Hurricane Sandy downstate in New York City. And then I started to do some digging on my own to see the connections between what was happening with our severe weather and the connections with climate change and how carbon emissions are making things more extreme. Uh, then I went to Boston where I started the country's first weekly series on climate change. And we provided coverage on everything from solutions to mitigation, which is cutting the carbon emissions through renewable energy to adaptation, finding ways that we can kind of coexist with our changing climate. And then we, we went on to uh, cover other uh, events while I was there in Boston and was on the ground for some of the biggest hurricanes during the 2016 uh, to 2020 realm, where we, again, had uh, tremendous hurricane activity across parts of the Gulf Coast and East Coast. And that's when I launched into Iowa to talk about climate change in a part of the country where uh, there wasn't a lot of connecting the dots between extreme weather and climate change. And unfortunately, uh, it was met with some pushback and last year a death threat. And at that point, it just didn't feel safe being uh, out there. And I came to the Woods Hole Group where I'm a senior scientist working on climate adaptation projects for communities across the country. Wow. First of all, what an amazing journey. And it's, it's ironic because like, people always say that you're struck by a lightning bolt when you, when you, uh, when you first get interested in something. And, and, and that's a great weather analogy. But then to, to see you end up in Iowa and have to deal with such uh, terrible circumstances, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, in the program. But I'm so sorry you had to, uh, to deal with it. I'm so glad you're in a safe spot now. Thanks. Um, Lauren. You had a very successful position as an on-air weather person in a big TV market in Philadelphia, among many others. And now you're a meteorologist with Climate Central's Climate Matters Initiative, which provides climate-related resources to more than 3,000 TV meteorologists and journalists across the U.S. What was that experience like for you, being the weather visionary for a major metropolitan area? And what were the demands of the job in, in, a, in a city like that? Uh, that's a great question. I like the term weather visionary. I'll take that. <laughs> um, you know, the demands of the job. Well, in one part, it's not demanded because I'm passionate about weather. I have, as Chris mentioned, ever since I was a young child, I was always fascinated by thunderstorms and hurricanes. And even today, like yesterday, I was texting people like the cirrus clouds in the sky. Those are from the outer bands of Hurricane Italia. <laughs> so I'm just as passionate today as I was when I was a wee child. So it's exciting to get up on TV in front of an audience and kind of share that passion for weather with them, both when weather is beautiful and when weather is very serious. So I'd say the most demanding part of the job, actually today is the two year anniversary of the remnants of Hurricane Ida coming through the Delaware Valley, where we had a number of tornadoes, including an EF3 tornado in New Jersey. And I believe we had a PDS or a particularly dangerous situation tornado warning, which we do not get in our area. And I remember being on air and kind of thinking about like, this is really bad. Like this is really going to affect people. And also when some warnings were coming out, texting some of my relatives and loved ones and saying, this is really serious all the same time while trying to track this tornado and give our audience the most apt and useful information they could to protect themselves because this was a real life, real world scenario with very dangerous weather on the ground. But that said, at times it can be really fun and talking about, you know, atmospheric uh, optical phenomenon and how rainbows form. Uh, so all of that can be really fun. But another challenge would be probably the, the schedule can be a little bit tricky. Uh, working holidays and working weekends. I worked weekends for a long time, but um, you know, so it has its pros and cons, but ultimately honored. And I interned in college at the NBC station here in Philadelphia with the legendary Hurricane Schwartz, who is still my mentor, I call him my weather dad. So uh, to come back and work in the same city that I interned in in college was just uh, a real, real treat and a real highlight of my career. That's amazing. And, and you're not working this weekend, this holiday weekend. So you're, you, you finally get the, the, a holiday weekend off. I am not working this weekend. <laughs> but just going back to a point that you made about um, uh, 
getting alerts for things that never happened. Uh, and this is for all three of you, but are we see are I know we're going to be seeing more of that in the future. That's something that we all have to really adjust to, isn't it? That that, that uh, the kinds of warnings, the kinds of the kinds of weather that we have not previously experienced because of climate change, it is going to uh, bring new uh, new new scenarios and new unfortunate scenarios to to new areas. Actually, that just happened. Um, that that just happened with uh, hurricane warnings being issued in inland locations of Georgia. Counties that had never ever had hurricane wind warnings had those happen because of Idalia. Uh, and that's because there has been very recent research within the past couple of years uh, that has indicated uh, that in this uh, new era of hyper intense hurricanes, uh, we're seeing the, uh, the damage extend much further inland away from the coast than what, uh, what used to be observed. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, the uh, National Weather Service offices and the National Hurricane Center opted to go ahead and extend those hurricane warnings well beyond the coastal counties. So that was definitely uh, unusual. And I know some emergency managers in, uh, in southeast Georgia went through a, a, a situation that they never faced before. It's, it's, it's very scary. And, and John, we're so, appreci so appreciative of you being here, especially this week, given what is happening in Florida right now, weather-wise. Uh, we also want to send our best to the people in Florida, Georgia, Cuba, and others recovering in the destructive path of Hurricane, Hurricane Adelia this week. Uh, but John, you served as an on-air meteorologist in South Florida for so many years, and, and, and you're still there. What did you learn about and what have you learned about climate by being in the eye of the storm, as it were, in the Florida, in the Florida area? Yeah, I mean, you might imagine Miami is uh, considered uh, one of, if not the most vulnerable city in terms of assets at risk on the planet, in terms of uh, what climate change is expected to bring. And therefore, if you ask me what the general response is from an audience that has been hearing from me probably for a couple of decades now about the uh, threat of climate change, generally, it's a very positive response. Uh, I, uh, you know, this is totally the opposite of what Chris went through in Iowa. Um, instead, uh, when I run into people, uh, you know, out and about, uh, people are either commenting or thanking me for my hur hurricane acumen, if you will, or thanking me for being the one broadcast meteorologist in South Florida who has been talking about this for a long time. And they say, you know, we don't understand why others are not doing it. Um, uh, we're so thankful that you keep bringing that up because we live here in a place that is under threat from the changing climate and we need to hear more and we need to hear about it more often. Um, so, so generally the response here um, is, is a positive one. If anything, uh, what's been hardest to manage has been newsroom managers um, uh, expectations regarding reporting on the climate crisis. Now, this has evolved, thankfully, but there was a time, you know, a, a more than half of the last 20 years in which I've been involved with this, in which I received a lot of pressure uh, to insert false equivalency or false balance into any type of reporting that I did on the climate crisis. What does that mean for the non-journalists that are watching out there? It means, you know, trying to find the other side of the story, which is something that journalists are trained to do. You know, when, when they're out on a story, uh, if they're trying to uncover some uh, corruption, just to give you an example, you know, they try to find somebody that, you know, the, the, that's defending themselves and saying, no, you know, this did, did not happen, etc. Well, uh, they try to apply the same to the scientific method, which does not work because, you know, the scientific, me scientific method through its processes yields the likely and eventually through iteration, the very likely and or factual circumstance of, of what we've been observing, right? Uh, so, so the journalistic method of doing things, which is finding the second side to a story, doesn't quite work with science. And that required uh, quite a bit of management on my behalf over the years to try to avoid putting folks on from, you know, some of these think tanks that we know are compromised in terms of uh, their attempts to um, 
uh, confuse the American public in regards to uh, global warming, right? And, and not, I'm not going to name names here necessarily, but they're out there. Um, uh, so, you know, I certainly found ways and I, I avoided doing that, but it was, it was difficult. And that's the biggest challenge I've had. That's amazing. Incredible insights from you. And, and uh, something they should teach in journalism schools, which is you can't both sides facts. If a fact exists, you can't, you can't look for the other alternative fact, you know. Exactly. Uh, gravity is gravity. Conway, smoking uh, causes point. cancer. That's it. <laughs> right. You can't. Right. Exactly. Um, and uh, it, it's a really good transition to, to what we were going to talk about next is, as the negative impacts of a warming planet have become more overt. Speaking the truth about climate change has become more important. After all, the more informed we are about a problem, the more empowered we become to do something about it. But still, some have tried to not deny that extreme weather and climate change are an issue at all. How do you approach, and John mentioned some of this already, but how do you approach conversations about climate change or extreme weather events in the midst of climate deniers? This is for all three of you. Uh, Chris, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, in Iowa, it was known as a purple state for a long time until it took a hard right turn in 2016. And we reached a point where ideology held more weight than facts, data, and science. Uh, I think that that is what we're competing with. Now, what's interesting is in, in Iowa, unlike South Florida, unlike when I was in Boston, we didn't get king tide flooding. It may not be as visual as the climate impacts across the other part of the country. But I would argue that the stakes are just as high in Iowa as they are in other parts of the country because of agriculture, which is 11% of the GDP in Iowa. But there's also a positive side of it as well, and that is the renewable energy aspect of the equation. And more than 60% of the grid in 2022 and now 2023 is powered by wind energy. And that is also supplemental income for farmers, usually getting five to $10,000 per turbine on their land, which is quite remarkable. Yet I was receiving pushback because largely that ideology over facts data and science, which is unfortunate, and it's really tough to compete with. But when you start breaking down, uh, for example, there's a severe weather outbreak that the forecast models weren't handling too well. We had this early season severe weather event, and there was a gentleman that I went back and forth with who called climate change a hoax. Uh, but when I kind of talked him off that ledge and we had conversations, he said, why are you the only one going with this high-end severe weather potential for early March. No one else is talking about it. Well, I was looking at the Gulf of Mexico, which was at near historic um, temperatures. And what the models weren't doing effectively, they weren't taking the system and injecting moisture into it because of that warm Gulf of Mexico. It wasn't really taking into account that excess or added fuel. Uh, and sure enough, the models when we got within 24 hours of the event hooked onto that solution, and we had a very early season major severe weather outbreak across the area. And that was a turning point for him, and I turned a skeptic into a believer, even though I hate using that term because you don't believe in something that is, you know, fact. It, facts are facts. Uh, but you, you deal with that pushback when you have an area where after 2016, they quite frankly feel emboldened and entitled to unleash hate and whatever they feel. And they believe that their feelings and their ideology weigh more than facts, science, and data, as I mentioned. So that is that tug of war that we're dealing with, especially in more conservative parts of the country. And argue, to John's point, when you're seeing it every day, maybe some fields go brown when there's not a lot of rain and you're in a drought in Iowa. But when you're not dealing with inundation at high tide on a sunny day, I can understand why a lot less people believe in the science in these parts of the country. Not where I am now, but where I was in, in Iowa. Well, just to, just to piggyback on that uh, thought for a moment, uh, just, uh, well, we're gonna, I'll come back to Chris in a second, but Lauren, do, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're talking to people about climate change, you really need to meet them where they are and bring them along with you. And you have to come to the conversation without a lot of judgment and try to keep it positive. So when you meet people where they are, that really enhances their ability to assimilate that information and to learn and to kind of move them along in accepting the science of climate change. And also a good way to bring them along is tying it, tying it into human health impacts. I mean, the cr climate crisis is a human health crisis as well. So talking about those health impacts, heat related illnesses, you know, and especially even less severe ones like uh, the prolonging of the allergy season. We put out a climate matters bulletin on the allergy season, the lengthening allergy season because of climate change and global warming. And it got so much feedback, so much media pickup because people were so interested because it's something that impacts our daily lives, even if it's a nuisance of just sneezing or more serious for people who have asthma. And then of course, the extreme heat even more serious than that, but just really kind of conveying how it impacts people's everyday lives, the lives of their family members, the lives of their neighbors and in their communities. And I think when you're talking about climate change, you do need to know your audience, as Chris was kind of talking about. You know, you need to know where they are at and frame your language accordingly. I think it's really important also to make it local, talk about the impacts that are occurring in their communities and also talking about shared values. What is important to those communities, to those people within those communities, and talk about how climate change is impacting things that they really appreciate the most in life. That's such a good point, Lauren. And uh, and um, when you talk about uh, local values and local um, perspectives, um, I, I, I think of Texas, which during the heat crisis of this summer with the heat domes and, and constant triple digit temperatures, um, if it weren't for the renewable energy, the wind energy that was powering the grid, they would have gone, uh, they would have been in, in even more hot water as it were. But there's not, doesn't seem to be a recognition in the local populace and perhaps it's because of the local um, news uh, organizations that feed them, that doesn't seem to be recognition that, that that is the case, that 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 renewable energy was really saving them. Uh, and, and Chris, back to back to you for a second. Uh, when we're talking about the Iowa population and and and, and noting uh, what an agricultural populace it is, did you get the sense that there are people who are working in agriculture who have recognition of climate change because because they see it more than more than more than many of us, did you get the sense that they were either silently not saying anything about it, but understanding it? Or what is your sense of, of, of what the climate crisis impact is in the farm community, the agriculture community? I think it's, it's broader than that, because what I saw after I left, well, I wasn't receiving a lot of positive feedback. When I left, I received hundreds of emails dozens of handwritten letters appreciative of the work I was doing. And it's very clear that if you look at George Mason University, the Yale program on climate change communication, if you look at their numbers, only 20% or less are either dismissive or deny climate change. Now, that's a very small fraction, and it really doesn't follow political lines. But those are the people that speak out against our coverage of climate change. And I had uh, a meteorologist, Jim Gandy, one of the first meteorologists to make the connections between climate change and extreme weather on TV in the Carolinas, nonetheless. He told me, Chris, how often do you go to a restaurant, enjoy the meal, and when you're done, you go on and provide a Yelp review or go into Google and give it a Google review? Admittedly, not very often. Uh, but if you're on vacation and the airline loses your bag, your flight was canceled or delayed, how likely are you to complain? <laughs> I'm guilty of that as well. Of course, I, I air my concerns and, and when I'm upset, I let them know. Uh, it's very similar. So you're looking at the small fraction and unfortunately, I think with our news management, they listened to that small fraction and asked me to, to dial it back and tone it down after their intentions were good by bringing me on to talk about climate change. So. Going back to your point of, of farmers and agriculture, yes, a lot were seeing changes, not talking to us at the station about it or writing in about it, but they were seeing changes in their yields, changes in growing seasons, starting earlier, uh, lasting longer, and then invasive species as well that were, they were having to contend with uh, in recent years. 
That's it's it's so fascinating. Uh, John, similarly, having worked in Florida and, and with and, and with ties to the Caribbean that you that you have, did you get a sense from your viewership and the communities that you serve that people were cognizant of the threats and negative impacts of climate change, or was there more of a head in the sand denial about it? No, as I hinted to or at before, uh, I think people here are aware of you know the long term existential threat of sea level rise. Uh, that's particularly the case in the Florida Keys. It spills into the megalopolis here of Miami, Fort Lauderdale. And then the further north you go in Florida, it's it's not that huge of an issue. Uh, for the inland communities, it is still for some of the coastal uh, cities like Tampa, which does have a sea level rise issue uh, to deal with as well. Uh, I can tell you that in the case of the Caribbean, uh, there's a lot of reconnaissance of the of the changes in particular in regards to the recent very, very strong hurricanes that have impacted those islands. You know, from Maria hitting Dominica and then on to Puerto Rico, uh, to Irma flattening uh, Barbuda right next to Antigua, and then uh, as well flattened in parts of the uh, British Virgin Islands. Uh, there is a concern that indeed, you know, how many more of these hyper intense Cat 4 and Cat 5 hurricanes are going to head our way. And they recognize and, and they know they may even know about the peer reviewed science that does indeed indicate that there is a greater proportion of tropical cyclones around the planet that are reaching category four and five intensity. And that of course is tied to the uh, very warm uh, sea surface temperatures. Very, very recently, I'll tell you as well, uh, that uh, because we've just lived through the hottest July in Earth's history, recorded history, um, and that uh, spilled over into South Florida, spilled over into the Caribbean as well, which had had an extremely hot June. I mean, you sum this all up, and generally for many of these spots, it's, it's uh, going to end up being the hottest summer uh, that anyone's ever lived through. Well, they're very cognizant of these very hot temperatures. The records we're setting day in and day out, whether it's air temperature or the combination of air temperature with humidity, where that uh, uh, heat index value is, is setting records of, and, and reaching very dangerous levels as well. Levels in, at, at which people start to succumb to heat exhaustion and potentially heat stroke, like what's happened right here in the Miami metro area where you know we've had agricultural workers die this very summer uh, due to heat stroke uh, so so yeah i mean i think people are aware um and generally like chris said the percentage of dismissives is 11. uh the percentage of doubtful might be 10 or 11 as well uh, generally speaking across the country three in four americans uh uh, accept the science of climate change. I'm avoiding that word belief uh, because it's, you know, you don't believe in science, right? But three out of four Americans accept the science of climate change and more than half of them uh, also accept that this is anthropogenic, that it's man-made. Uh, so there is a perception out there that uh, this subject matter should never be brought up because it's like talking religion and politics at the Thanksgiving table. But in reality, in reality, most people agree that what we're seeing is being caused by man-made climate change. And it's not as controversial a subject as you might imagine, and it ought to be talked about more. It's such, it's such a great point. And, and, and while we're approaching a political season, without getting too political here, there, was, um, there, there seems to be on one side of the political aisle a uh, distaste for, or or a, a, a refusal to to accept what you just said that that climate change is either real or man made, and and I guess that's what it, for for those of us not in Florida, I guess that's what confuses us about the Florida populace uh, in terms of the the political leanings that they that they may have. But I mean, I, I I can certainly comment a lot about that. I can tell you that Florida. You know, it's it's almost county by count by county in terms of uh, people's worldviews, and north of Interstate Four, which uh, bisects the peninsula uh, from Tampa to Daytona, uh, you know, you're going to find uh, uh, perhaps more of the dismissives and doubtfuls. 
that you'll find in areas like Miami and and uh, Broward County, which is where Fort Lauderdale is, and, and other locations. So th there's definitely uh, a dichotomy in views. Uh, I know it's polarizing, but the truth is deep down inside when you ask people and you do these surveys, and this is again through George Mason and the Yale Climate uh, Communications Program, and they do this, by the way, they've been doing this for a decade or more. Every single year they do these surveys. So we know what those numbers are, not just in a static snapshot, but we know it through an entire uh, a, a decade or so. And the number of alarmed and concerned about the climate crisis continues to grow while the number of dismissives and doubtfuls either is steady or slightly diminishing over time. They're, they're, they're pretty stubborn, though. It's kind of get, you know, difficult to get them off their uh, worldview, the tribal view. Well, well, we've talked extensively about the Florida audience and the Iowa audience. How about the Philly audience? It's, the Philly market is not known for, for being soft. This is the town whose sports fan base booed Santa Claus famously. Uh, Lauren, working with the Philly audience, what was it like trying to, commu to communicate this issue with the TV audience in Philly? Yeah, you know, we're a tough crowd, but I'm originally from the area, so maybe uh, that's why they accepted me a little bit more. <laughs> but you kind of have to go in with no fear just <laughs> and present the information. But overall, you know, talking about climate change in Philly, I had a really great experience. Of course, as Chris and John were both talking about, there are the group of dismissives of about 10%. And unfortunately, they just happen to be the loudest crowd. Those are the ones that are going to get online and make an obnoxious just comment on your social media. But for the most part, when I encounter people on the street, they say, thank you for talking about climate change. You know, I wanted to learn more about this and, or you taught me something. So uh, the reception was really great. I was in Philadelphia for seven years and uh, so no snowballs thrown at me, thankfully. But uh, you can see even there is an appetite in the audience really all across the country. And that can be found in the numbers for our Climate Matters program, which was launched in 2012. So we provide research, content, data, graphics to journalists and broadcast meteorologists in the hopes that they will then go on and disseminate that to their viewers and viewership, users, readers. So uh, back in 2012, we had 55 television hits pick up of our material. And as of 2021, we had over 5,600. So the appetite is there. Same with media hits. If you count in print, TV, social media, 310 in 2012, as of 2021, over 15 and a half thousand. So people want this information. They're interested in it. And certainly, you know, TV stations, having worked in TV for a long time, I know management's not going to put anything on air that the viewers aren't interested in, and that's not going to boost their ratings. So it's clear that the people want this type of information. They want to learn about climate science and how it's impacting their communities. Well, on that note, uh, Lauren, what do you think the role of media in informing the public on new sciences and driving conversations about climate change should be? That's a great question. And, you know, really we need to give people the information. That's the role of the media, right? We need to tell them the truth about what's going on, being honest about what we know and what we don't know. So really kind of bringing it down to their level. We talked a little bit about uh, at the top of the webinar about complex scientific issues and making it simple. You know, when I started out in meteorology many years ago as a broadcast meteorologist in Macon, Georgia, um, you know, I had my undergrad degree and was very excited about all these fancy terms that I knew, vorticity and things like this, vertical velocity, you know, Coriolis force. And you get up there and you want to say these terms to kind of like prove your credibility, but that helps nobody. You know, it's your job as a meteorologist or a journalist, a scientist, to take that more complex language and break it down for people to understand so they can digest that and they can understand that better. And when they have the information, they can go on to make better decisions. So putting it really in simple language, plain language is a big responsibility for journalists and meteorologists. Uh, and scientists. And John, how about you? What do you think of the, the role that media should be in informing the public? And, and would you ever use the word vorticity in your uh, broadcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I wouldn't be surprised if I have, uh, just because in, in, uh, 
when we do wall to wall uh, hurricane coverage, which which can go on for days, <laughs> it means that my weather segments could be can be as long as 17, 18 minutes <laughs> each. Uh, so so I wouldn't be surprised if I if I brought it up. Uh, listen, no, uh, you know, back in two thousand and seven, um, Bob Ryan. Uh, uh, preeminent uh, broadcast meteorologist now retired from WRC in Washington, D.C., the NBC station in Washington. Uh, perhaps, I believe, the only broadcaster to ever be president of the American Meteorological Society. And at the time, in 2007, I was commissioner on professional affairs for the American Meteorological Society. So we, him as past president, me as commissioner, uh, we wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society urging broadcast meteorologists around the country, the members of the AMS, and there's, you know, out of the 14,000 or so members of AMS, there's about 2,000 that are broadcast meteorologists, urging them to uh, present the state of the science of climate change, obviously in layman terms, but to present it um, and add it and... and uh, provide that climate in their weather segments and divorce themselves from their own biases, political views, and just present that to, to the audience because we, um, as leaders of the American Meteorological Society and with the support of the AMS Council, uh, felt that it was urgent to make sure the broadcast meteorologists were presenting this to audiences because of the looming threat. And listen, back in the aughts, uh, we were just starting to see maybe some extreme weather events here and there, but it's nothing like what we're seeing today, where they're coming, you know, fast and furious. Uh, uh, so, you know, that pretty much summarizes my view on this, which is, yes, media has to play a role. Broadcast news has to play a role in providing people with the information that they need uh, to, to be able to realize you know, what, what the state of the science is, which is, you know, this is serious, it's us, right? Uh, but at the same time, let, let's also provide some hope, right? And let's, let's present some of the solutions that are out there. The solutions for this crisis are out there. You know, we're not gonna stop it on a dime and, and make a 180 and, and, and be able to resolve everything in a matter of a year, no, you know, but we need to slow the, the the rate at which we're warming the atmosphere and the planet, we need to slow that down because we're going to be in deep trouble if we continue down this path. Uh, so, so yes, the media needs to play a role in educating the American public to make sure the American public then uh, takes not just individual actions, all right? That's important too. It's not about you know whether I can afford an electric car or not, or whether I can put up solar panels in my house or not, or, or even if I'm composting in my backyard. It's not so much about that. It's about making sure that people are empowered through education, through facts, without throwing the textbook at them, okay? Like Lauren said, we need to meet people where they're at. Meet people where they're at so they understand the, the threat. And then these folks not just take individual action, but start to advocate for climate action. And that can take many forms. From, from talking to your neighbor, could be just as simple as talking to your neighbor about it. You know, heat wave, what, what is going on? My goodness, this climate. To yes. making sure that we get leaders in place that are taking this crisis seriously could potentially be the game changer here, right? We need regional, state, national, and international collaboration if we're going to get to where we need to go. It's not up to the individuals. It's not up to the corporations because they're not going to do it. This needs to be regulation, and it needs to be at the national and international level, and, and, and that's where the vote is so important. That's a great segue to uh, to the next question. But before I raise that next question, I want to let the audience know that we'll be taking your questions very shortly. Just two more questions here uh, for the panel, then we'll go to some audience questions. Uh, in the face of all the challenges the world is facing right now, 
from nuclear safety to the threat of climate change, the Samuel Lawrence Foundation always likes to think about hope in the midst of all the adversity, the good work that is being done by excellent reporters and scientists like yourselves, as well as what our listeners can do themselves to engage with these issues. What can people listening in do today, uh, as John just mentioned, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, suggestions to improve their own climate literacy and better engage with science and the media? Let's turn to Chris for this, because John already gave us a couple of good suggestions there. Yeah, to build on what John said is being part of the conversation. And in my new role, a large part of what I do is I work with communities to find ways to build resilience, become uh, adaptable to the, the changing planet, find ways to mitigate some of the impacts or the, uh, the sources of, of climate change, right, by cutting those carbon levels. Those are all critical steps, and people really need to let their voices be heard in these conversations. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is the largest sum of money that's been devoted to climate action, which is terrific. Uh, I, I, talk for another time is I think that it was poorly explained to the public and the PR campaign for the IRA was a complete and total bust. Uh, but the money is there and these projects now have the momentum to continue into the future. But people need to help dictate how these projects unfold the priorities. We need to make sure that all parts of the community are part of that conversation, especially environmental justice communities. So we want a environment for these, these talks, these conversations. So that is what I'm building on what, from what John said. But voting, which is something else he said, is also critical. And when we you know, go next November uh, to, the, to the polling place, you need to find somebody who's willing to take climate action seriously and make it a top priority. Absolutely. Lauren, do you have anything to add in, in this topic? In terms of yeah, like what good just, people can do? Yeah, just I think a big component of climate literacy is knowing credible sources. So knowing who to go to and as journalists and broadcast meteorologists, we should help that along and supply them with credible sites to go to, you know, go to NOAA, go to NASA, kind of helping people to distinguish between the misinformation and the true credible scientific information. And also reading up, I think, on solutions and new solutions. Not only does that enhance one's climate literacy, but I think it kind of combats that climate fatigue or the doom and gloom associated with climate change. Uh, so just recently, I was reading about uh, Michigan State University University uh, for their commuter lot, they have started covering parking spots with solar panels. Also in France, the French Senate just approved a bill that new and existing parking lots with more than 80 spaces have to be half covered with solar panels. So not only does it protect your car, keep it from the sun and the wind and the rain, but it's generating energy as well. And all of the land use controversy of, you know, acquiring farmland and converting that to solar wind, or excuse me, solar panel fields that kind of pushes that to the side. So we really need to increase the solar in our urban areas. And we're starting to move towards that. So there is a lot of positivity. There are many solutions, as John was saying, and we can read a lot about a lot of those every day. Lauren, you just gave such a great uh, example of the power of storytelling, because just giving those two little anecdotes about Michigan State and France, just really, it's, it, it's, it, it's exciting to hear about the solutions that are out there and what people are doing. So thank you for sharing those. Um, we're on the cusp of the, this is the last question before we open up to the audience. We're on the cusp of the annual environmental season for September to December with key annual conferences such as UNGA, which is UN General Assembly and Climate Week here in New York uh, in September. And then the annual UN Climate Conference known as COP in November, December, which will this year be in Dubai in a petro state of all places. As we approach the end of 2023, we're also nearing the 2030 deadline to, to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the IPCC report sixth assessment has made it clear that we need to transition to 100% renewable energy. What do we need to focus on and achieve in this absolutely critical 15 week gauntlet between the start of UNGA and the end of COP? What should be the focus of those conferences? Let me uh, throw that one to uh, John. Well, I mean, listen, um, we, we have to be, I, I think there needs to be a frank discussion. If you ask me what, what should be the number one priority, 
you know, we are not on track. You know, I don't want to let, let's not sugarcoat it is what I'm trying to say. The, I, I don't care how many uh, commitments the different countries have pledged. Uh, uh, you know, we are not slowing down the burning of fossil fuels fast enough. Uh, and, and I think there, you know, an urgency, a, a sense of urgency. And I know we hear this every year, every year. And, you know, I don't know how much hope there is in this new cop that's going to be over at, um, uh, in, in, is it Dubai? Um, you know, that there's going to be any progress there just because things do tend to move very, very slowly when you're talking about international collaboration of 200 different countries. Uh, uh, but, but man, I mean, just let's not sugarcoat it. We are, there, there is not enough being done right now and more urgent action is needed. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that for the other panelists. John or Lauren? I'm, I'm sorry, Chris or Lauren? You know, I mean, just to, to you know, look at that fact where, where so many people are saying, what about China? What about India? Well, China is actually surpassing uh, solar installations, surpassing the United States in solar installations in the last couple of years, which is quite remarkable. I know that they're building uh, plants that are fossil fuel run, but they are taking steps to embrace renewable energy. But even if you take that out of the equation, whatever happened to leading by example? And I think we really have lost our moral compass, which is really unfortunate. We're an international superpower. And in that role, we should be finding every way possible, not just scaling what we have with renewables, but putting money into research and development and finding other alternatives too, to make sure that we can scale those so we can get to, uh, to net zero. So I, I just wish that we could, we could change that mindset of the others aren't doing it. Why should we have to do it? Let's lead by example. And, and to play on Lauren's point from earlier about some of the examples that she gave, uh, there's the opportunity uh, uh, equation there, where there are there there is money to be made if we can transition. The the, the companies or the, or or the, or the investors that back renewable energy have an opportunity to really uh, uh, to to have to have new ground to conquer. Uh, all right. Well, let, let's 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 move on to uh, Bart. Do you want to come back on and ask the first question? Oh, that's great, Lance. And and as I as I hear people talk, I suddenly realize that a uh, cabinet position should be a climate change leader because everything seems to be so involved with. Um, and 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 John, I'm looking at a map of of Florida right now because uh, it's Samuel Lawrence Foundation where we we. we Perhaps uh, nuclear energy is not a is not a solution for renewable energies because I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six nuclear power plants on the east coast of Florida, and one in Gainesville on the west coast where there's there are these hurricanes bearing down, and I think about our own San Onofre nuclear power plant that's been that's been um, dismantled, but there's three and a half million pounds of nuclear waste sitting in uh, thin thin metal canisters on the beach 100 feet from the ocean and all these surprise hurricanes. We know that these nuclear power plants that are operating need a billion gallons a day of cooling water with rivers drying up and oceans, temperature rising. What is the concern of the panel? for um, this with respect to nuclear power plants in, in this country on the coast and also around the world. Is there any comments that Chris you'd like to make? Um, I mean, when you look at renewable sources of energy, uh, I mean, safety is, is, is critical. And, um, you know, I, I think that we need to uh, explore safe forms of, of renewable energy. Um, you know, I, I come from Long Island where we had Shoreham and, and there were concerns with that a family in Pennsylvania that had to deal with Three Mile Island. So I know that there are concerns, uh, but 
I think that what we have now uh, is important in, in getting us to net zero, but there was an MIT professor uh, a couple of years back that I was listening to during a talk and he said, chances are the technology that really will propel us to net zero doesn't even exist yet. So that's why when I say research and development is so critical that we need to be spending time too to find other options to what is already out there. Uh, because it, it really is, John mentioned earlier, it, it's on all hands on deck, not just us, not just universities. It's, it's a whole global effort. It's a collective effort. And uh, we can't just stop our research with the, with the technology that we have now. We have to keep going with that. Yeah, so I'll just mention uh, that, uh, sorry about that echo, hopefully that's not me. Uh, there, there, there are some concerns um, regarding the perhaps location of one plant, the Turkey, the Turkey Point Power Plant uh, is uh, down here in uh, extreme southeastern Florida along the coast, although it is uh, at a pretty high elevation uh, to be safe from storm surge. Um, so, but, but that doesn't mean that local um, activists in particular have not been looking at that with, it, with uh, very carefully and, and as well, uh, local uh, news outlets uh, have looked at that over the years. The bottom line is the Florida Power and Light did receive uh, an extension of the operating license for, uh, I believe, 40 more years. Uh, it's going to make it, uh, Turkey Point might end up having then a total of 80 years of licensing, which might be the longest one in the entire country. Um, however, and, and this is not going to be popular here, but uh, to me, uh, uh, nuclear power is part of the tools. And I know that's not a very popular viewpoint here, uh, but um, uh, there are new uh, ways of looking at that tool, uh, including sodium cooled, including modular, uh, you know, generation four and, and, and onwards of, uh, of plants. Uh, always, like Chris said, making sure the safety is a prime concern. Uh, but uh, I just don't, you know, unless some of these other technologies that Chris is suggesting, and maybe maybe we have fusion, uh, you know, instead of fission coming up someday. Uh, and wouldn't that be incredible? But they're not here yet. Um, and, and we need to stop injecting fossil fuel burnings into the atmosphere yesterday. And that's why nuclear, for me, is a part of the solution, be it not with old water-cooled plants, be it with sodium cooled, be it with modular, but I believe uh, that that technology needs to be a part of it. And now you can all throw your rotten tomatoes at me. <laughs> um, I will, I, uh, Bart, do you want to jump in? Or I, I, I was going to uh, point to uh, one thing that Chris said is that, that uh, an MIT professor said that we may not yet have the solutions that we need. A, a counterpoint to that is that we may already have the solutions that we need. We just need the political will to embrace them. Uh, can, uh, if we were to have wind, solar and hydro and, and, and just, I'll, I'll keep nuclear out of the equation for the moment, would that be sufficient to, uh, to generate the power that we need if we also have batteries to store the power that we accumulate? And Lance, let me add that the one thing that, that John says is absolutely true. We need more, and Chris said as well, we need more research and development. Uh, small modular reactors are not yet scaled. The the sodium, the natrium um, nuclear reactors, uh, as we saw in, in Simi Valley, blow up and cause cancer. So these these pro projects are really wonderful if they're scaled and if research is done to make them safe. The biggest concern right now, and the the sty in the eye of the nuclear industry, is the waste. This waste is the most dangerous thing on the planet for uh, 100,000 years or 250,000 years. And, and that, so, so until, I mean, I, I'm not a panelist, but I can tell you that as soon as we get, figure out what to do with the waste, that's safe. Um, safer than using it, weaponizing it as, as the Russians 
do in Zachariah, then until we, we got to think, John, we have to, what are we going to do with the waste, John? Well, no, that's a very good question. I mean, you know, we, we've, we've been in, sadly, uh, and very unfortunately, using uh, the planet as as a, a, a dump, right, through all these years. And then everything came to a head, uh, you know, around the time of the Cuyahoga uh, River fire uh, there in, uh, in and around Cleveland. And when we had that spill over in California, and then suddenly in the late 60s and early 70s, there was this wave of environmental regulation, which actually happened during a, re a Republican administration. A lot of these, you know, NEPA and Clean Air Act and, and Clean Water Act were all signed around that time in the early 70s. Um, Nixon, yeah. So, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not dancing around the question, uh, you know, and, and not by, by using horrible past examples of what we've been doing to just justify that we're going to continue to do it in the future. Uh, let, let's just say that the R&D um, in nuclear like, uh, you know, like the federal government is doing now in Idaho, uh, needs to continue to progress and, and needs to be accelerated, in my opinion, because, uh, the you know, I mean, look at France and all the, you know, I know the waste is there, but I mean, look at how they used nuclear energy to power themselves through decades on end. Um, it, it, the waste is a problem, but I think uh, if we're going to, if we're, if we're not going to go back to the Stone Age in terms of, you know, how the lifestyles of people are going to be, then in my opinion, uh, nuclear power can be a part of it if properly implemented. And then France now has 60% uh, of their nuclear waste, uh, of their nuclear energy shut down because the rivers are dried up and, and uh, they have cracks and corrosion in the existing plants and they still don't know what to do with waste. But you, I, I say more research and development, just as Chris said. Uh, Lauren, do you have any um, uh, do you have any suggestions or comments? I think it's great to talk about these large scale solutions because we certainly need them. We need to curb our reliance on fossil fuels. It's paramount and we do that as quickly as possible. But we also need to think about adaptation and dealing with the impacts that, you know, communities and our citizens are seeing right now. And particularly talking about extreme heat coming off, as John mentioned, the hottest July ever in the history of the planet. You know, I look around in Philadelphia. I live in the city, you know, historically redlined neighborhoods lack a lot of tree cover. They lack the canopy, they lack urban green space. And that of course exacerbates the urban heat island effect in some cases by up to 20 degrees from one neighborhood to another. So we really need both large scale and small scale solutions to deal with our future, but also adaptation measures that help our people right now in the present. And in, in, in terms of what Lauren's talking about, in uh, climate justice as well. Yeah. Uh, Bart, do we I have mean, another the, question? Fale, do we have another question from the audience? Uh, what is the most challenging aspect of translating complex uh, climate science into understandable and actionable information for the public? It's got to be the vorticity. <laughs> it always is. <laughs> Uh, Chris, um, do you want to take that one? Oh, yeah, ahead, I, I think th that you can't be overly technical. And, and Lauren and John both mentioned this. You can't just impress people with jargon and expect them to to think, uh, you know, you're going to convert their their thought process in. in but tying it to how it affects people day to day is critical. Why does it matter to them? How does it affect their uh, families? And what does their future look like? That is how you can simply bring it down, but also using a lens to try to help uh, fact check some of the misinformation, disinformation. And I'll just give this uh, a quick example. Uh, there's been this campaign to say that climate related disasters, fatalities caused by them have been going down since 1920. And if you look at the graph, you believe it. But the fact is that data set started in 1900. And if you look at the data prior to 1920, it would not be as dramatic as a drop. Technology has improved. Uh, warnings have improved, the science has improved, 
Uh, and also what they weren't taking into account is the fact that there were other issues uh, that were happening uh, during these times of famine or drought or so if you look at the bigger picture there's an explanation why so if you see or hear something make sure and to lauren's point you're getting it from a credible source not somebody that's trying to uh, persuade you uh you know against the science and that's what we're dealing with and also you know a lot of photoshopped graphics and graphs that are out there i mean just take a close look at like the, the climate stripes for example and 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 my my recommendation to climate dismissives that are out there being vocal if i have advice for you do a better job of photoshopping <laughs> john you were going to say i believe um well, I mean, I, I think knowing your audience might be perhaps one of the biggest challenges. Um, I mean, look at what you've heard during this uh, during this webinar, right? Uh, Chris had a certain experience in Iowa. I've had a completely different experience in South Florida and with my Caribbean uh, coverage. Um, you know, it, when you know your audience, you're a better presenter, um, and and uh, I think I think that's a big challenge. There's a, there's a there's a broadcast meteorologist currently in Charlotte. Her name is Elisa Rafa, and uh, uh, she uh, her career started, I believe, in Sioux City, and then went to Springfield, Missouri, and then is now in Charlotte, North Carolina. And she has found a way to communicate on climate to where she hasn't really run into trouble at these different locations because she has found ways to relate to the audience and find relatable subject matter that will interest the audience along the lines of the subject matter of climate change. Uh, and, and people then suddenly realize, oh, my, you know, it's affecting uh I mean, I think she did a story on beer uh, once and how it was affecting, you know, hops and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, I think when you find folks that can understand the audience and on top of that, be able to uh, still present the information and not, uh, you know, not, not run into trouble, um, th those folks are... are, are um, are, are very uh, commendable in what they do, but that, that uh, set of skills is very difficult to, uh, to put together. It, it's just hard. It, it's, it's hard in cer certain parts of this country to get that message across in an uncontroversial way. Fale, do we have time for another question? Looks like we do. Um, how do we move from, in oh, go ahead, Bart. No, no, how, to, how do we move from individual to collective action on climate change. Let's give this one to Lauren. Uh, she hasn't had a chance to speak recently. That's a good question. And again, I think it's really focusing on the local and bringing communities together on aspects that they care about in their community, in their cities, and those shared values that can help people get motivated and organized. And again, bringing in, I love the local solutions element of things that people can get excited about to help improve their communities, not only combating climate change or making their local air easier to breathe and cleaner, cooling things down, but really that shared experience of wanting to make where you live, your neighborhoods, your communities, your states, um, healthier and happier and cooler for everyone to have kind of that uh, both physical and mental health and just uh, quality of life that we're all looking for. And, you know, climate change is I think sometimes people can see it as this kind of big nebulous, very kind of complex and it is issue but 
in reality, climate change is something that we're all contending with every day in our neighborhoods. And we can see evidence of that, you know, from things like extreme weather to smaller things, as I mentioned previously, to the extended allergy season. So and really honing in and discussing those impacts, those real life, real world impacts in a way that is truthful and honest and saying what we know and what we still have to learn about and then getting ex people excited about solutions and getting people excited about cooperating instead of disagreeing and bumping heads. I want to see more people joining Climate Matters too. And I think that just a collective action as meteorologists that are watching this, perhaps at, at a later uh, point in time, uh, you know, we're the station scientists. The American Meteorological Society did a tremendous job promoting us as the scientists at the station since we do have a background in science. But I will add, if you feel comfortable talking about astronomy, geology, geography, then you should damn well be okay to talk about climate change. It's our job to keep the public safe. And during a hurricane, that's what John does in Florida. And then the severe weather across parts of the Mid-Atlantic, like when Lauren was on, and when I was on in Boston with nor'easters or Iowa with tornadoes, but when the weather is quiet, we need to keep our viewers safe to climate change. There needs to be even more meteorologists doing this. You can't be deathly afraid of not being liked. We're journalists at the end of the day, and that's to provide facts. Yeah, I, I'm gonna jump in brilliant, just to say, brilliant. Uh, just to, uh, I'm going to jump in to say that I think that if we can, if we can get people talking about it, all right, it, it's go, it's going to move from individual to collective action. You know, an example earlier, you, uh, and and it's easier to talk about it. These things are. If it's hot, it's not just because. It's because all of that in the background has been the you know unrelenting rise in temperatures over the last several decades caused by climate change uh, and and just find you know find things that you have in common with the people that you're talking to if you like to you know if you like to jog even if you you walk your dog and you run into people you know it's so hot or what about you know you see that rainstorm yesterday my goodness the you know i've never seen it rain that hard in such a short amount of time well you know what there's a climate link to that too there's a climate link to just about everything that we're seeing that hasn't been seen, seen before in terms of extreme weather and because everybody likes to talk about the weather then why not just give that climate context along the way if more people start to talk about it to family, neighbors, et cetera, I think it's going to become one of these things where people are starting, are starting to realize that together, together, we're going to be able to find the solutions as opposed to, you know, these individual actions, which are simply not enough. It's a brilliant point as well. And um, it will affect supply chain. It will affect us in so many ways that we don't yet that, that, that so many don't yet realize uh, when you think about the, the permafrost thawing and how that is unleashing uh, 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 um, uh, v viruses and things of that nature that had, ne that had, that had been uh, off the table for so long that there's, there's so many implications and so many uh, uh, w ways that climate, the climate is affecting us. Um, thank you, Chris, Lauren and John for that insightful discussion, for all the wisdom that you've shared with us today. We have our challenges ahead certainly but the hope you've given us is truly inspiring that concludes our program today to rewatch the the webinar oh, oh we have another question sorry sorry oh the Mark, last question yeah with extreme with, with extreme weather and climate change nuclear is the most is is nuclear the most dangerous solution another fukushima waiting to happen can we ignore that i think you know we've really already you've already answered that John, with your interest and, and Chris in, in developing more, more future research and development on all of these things. So, Lauren, is there anything you want to say with this? Um, I think John and Chris answered that question sufficiently, but certainly I think, uh, you know, getting the opinion of community members of where these nuclear plants exist or could potentially exist or be built is an important element in how they feel um, that's going to impact their communities, their daily lives, what concerns they have about potential dangers. So um, I think that, that is an important component as well. 
That's great. Um, okay, I think that concludes our program today. <laughs> to rewatch the webinar, to see a transcript, go to the Samuel Lawrence Foundation website in the coming days. The website, which is also in the chat, is samuellawrencefoundation.org. Thank you so much to Beyond Nuclear, Sierra Club Canada, and the Blue Planet Alliance. Be sure to join the Blue Planet Alliance Partnership Pledge at blueplanetalliance.org. To learn more about all the critical work that all these participating parties are doing to advance renewable energy and other sustainable initiatives, and to stay informed about upcoming events and important initiatives, sign up for the newsletters of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation and Brooklyn Story Lab at brooklynstorylab.net. Also, make sure you join us for the next Samuel Lawrence Foundation First Friday series on October 6th. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>